Well, it sure has been a treat to be with you. Everyone has uh, given us uh, the legendary Nova Scotian hospitality, and we're so glad that you all kept some of the leaves on your trees for us as we have toured around and gotten to enjoy much of uh, the, the wonderful color and uh, of this landscape. We've been taking lots of pictures and uh, eating lots of good seafood, and we're going to go back uh, with lots of, of warm memories and several additional pounds by which to remember you. <laughs> I'm delighted for that. So thank you very much for having us. I also appreciate the quality of the conversation where Carrie and I have been enjoying with uh, faculty and staff and students here at Acadia. Uh, we'd heard lots of good things about you, and we're glad to know that uh, they're all true. And uh, we're, we're uh, going to bring back very happy tidings uh, to the other uh, coast when we get there in a few days, God willing. Because the paradigm I have offered in these lectures is neither complementarian nor typically egalitarian, it can be challenged from both sides. Let's consider then a variety of arguments tonight to see how well this paradigm measures up to the alternatives. As we do so, we'll remember one of the principles of theological method that we established in the first lecture. The task of Christian theology is not to arrive at the one timeless, seamless answer that fits everything nicely into place without strain and without remainder. It would be wonderful if we could do that, but it is often impossible. The task instead is to formulate an interpretation that does the best job relative to the other options of explaining most of the most important data and as much of the remainder as possible. The fact then, and I think it is a fact, that my paradigm does not explain every detail as well as does another interpretation must be acknowledged in the interest of both Christian honesty and in the interest of the humble openness we should all maintain in hopes of having our ideas improved. For if I dismiss a contrary datum or interpretation, if I explain it away or otherwise circumvent it, I miss an opportunity to reconsider and reconstruct my interpretation for the better. But the fact that my paradigm does not explain every detail as well as does another interpretation in any particular case doesn't mean it isn't the best one overall that is currently available. And if it is, then it's the one we ought to adopt. Now, I've tried to deal fairly with arguments from particular scriptures in the foregoing discussions. Now we can encounter other sorts of arguments from theology, from church history, and from contemporary experience and practice. First, then, some arguments from theology. Number one, the relations among members of the Trinity demonstrate how men and women should treat each other. The first troubling thing to notice here is that this argument is deployed by both complementarians and egalitarians. Complementarians argue that the members of the Trinity are indeed co-equal, but the Son and Spirit willingly submit to the Father, and the Spirit humbly bears witness, not to himself, but to the Son. Thus, women can submit to men without feeling automatically devalued. Egalitarians argue from the co-equality of the members of the Trinity to the opposite conclusion, that the members of the Trinity in fact play different roles, but none of them dominates the other. Indeed, they are all involved in all aspects of divine work, from creation through redemption to consummation, in an interplay of mutual joy and cooperation. Now, for my part, I think the complementarians get the better of this sort of argument. The Father is always pictured in the Bible in the supreme position and never rotates off that position for another member of the Trinity. The Son always is pictured as deferring to the Father, and the Spirit is sent by the Father in the name of the Son. The problem I have with the complementarian reference to the Trinity, then, is that I think it's a bad theological move to attempt by anyone on any side of this issue. For one thing, the Trinity is our three. 
And when it comes to gender, we're instead talking about two. For another thing, the Divine Father and Son are depicted in the Bible as, yes, two males. And even the Spirit is referred to in scriptural pronouns as male, even though our theology reminds us that God is not actually male. So it's not clear to me how that helps us with male-female relations. Finally, it's in Genesis 1 in which we encounter the introduction of the idea of human beings, male and female, created in the image of God. And in this passage, there is no explicit reference to the Trinity at all. Indeed, nowhere in the Bible does an author draw implications from the nature of the Trinity to human relations. Many theologians, and I among them, strongly endorse circumspection when it comes to the theological device of using one of the great mysteries of the faith, the internal life of God himself and the Trinity, to shed light on some other doctrine. The question of gender seems to be one of those doctrines not much improved by reference to the Trinity, as is evidenced by the fact that everyone seems to be able to selectively access this doctrine in the interest of contradictory understandings of gender. In short, I find this whole line of theological reasoning unhelpful, and therefore neither an obstacle nor a boon to my investigation of gender. So much then for that. Okay? It's a bad idea for anybody to use it, so, so, so don't. That's my advice. A second argument from theology. The submission of wives to husbands and the care of husbands for wives provides an important picture of the relationship of God with Israel and, later, of Christ and the Church. <clears throat> now, there can be no disputing this basic observation of the way God has depicted his relationship with his people in the Bible. God wonderfully took up the best traits of masculinity in ancient cultures to tell believers important things about his love and power and initiative and faithfulness on their behalf. He also modeled for them, thereby, how husbands were to treat their wives in such cultures, as Paul argues at some length in Ephesians 5 regarding Christ and the church. Yet, as we have discussed earlier, the problem remains for those of us in modern society in which the symbols have changed their meanings. When patriarchy is now odious and retains few of the positive connotations of its ancient heritage on which the biblical portraits depended, and when women and men are equal so that we no longer reflect anything of the vast difference between God and his people that previously was reflected by patriarchal marriage, does it make sense to carry on this symbolism? I deeply doubt that God wants us to continue in what is now a deeply problematic drama, a drama that to many people today, both within the church and without, bespeaks a deity's domination of his inferiors rather than the biblically intended message of our gracious Lord's care for his dependents. So let's be clear. By maintaining egalitarianism in our place and time, we are not discarding these inspiring biblical pictures of God's care for his people. We retain them in the Bible, embedded as they are in patriarchal cultures in which they made good sense and we can retrieve them from the Bible for our edification even in an egalitarian culture as long as we do so with hermeneutical sensitivity to just what God is and isn't saying in such a depiction of himself and his beloved. Now I'm going to take a quick poll to see whether you want to talk about this third one or not. And, and I want to know whether, especially in Baptist country, this is a waste of your time, quite seriously. Uh, I was going to skip it, but we actually have time for it if you, if you care. A third theological argument sometimes adduced, even by Protestants, is this one. The pastor is a priest, an intermediary between God and his people, and thus he stands in for Christ 
and only a male person can properly represent Christ in this role. Now, do you actually care about that argument? If, if, does anybody actually care much about that, or should we just skip it? Is anybody actually listening? <laughs> Some of you say, well, yeah, I've actually never heard that argument before, so I don't know uh, what, what I said. So, 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 have some of you heard that? Sorry? Uh, well, no, 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 it isn't. Uh, <clears throat> but, but it's often deployed, so maybe, maybe I'll talk about it for just a couple minutes. Uh, that, that, that's a that's, that's good, good answer, uh, right? Well, let me, let me say a little bit about this that might surprise you, actually, because it actually is going to come back and, and, and bite Baptists, too. So, but, but first, uh, out here in the Maritimes, we'll have uh, a little bit to say about Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics have argued this way for a long time, given their particular sacramental understanding of priesthood. As a Protestant, however, I don't share this vision of what it means to pastor a church, and I defend the Protestant affirmation of the priesthood of all believers, not just males and not just clergy. So this argument just doesn't count for me. Furthermore, I find it extremely odd that any other Protestant would take it seriously, as some apparently do. Uh, it's not surprising, perhaps, that C.S. Lewis argues this way. It's even more surprising to see it argued by the latter-day Puritan J.I. Packer, but he does. Were I persuaded, however, of this view of pastor as priest in the role of intermediary, I still would not find this argument compelling. For why is it Jesus Christ's maleness that must be figured in the person of the priest? Why not his Jewishness, so much for Gentiles, or his singleness? I realize that this is exactly the Roman Catholic argument for clerical celibacy. Or his middle age, no younger or older priests, please. Or his able-bodiedness, no room here for disabled people, and so on. The strongest point that can be made for the significance of the maleness of Jesus and that of priests is indeed much like the previous argument that maleness in a patriarchal culture bespeaks something important about God and God's representatives. But what about an egalitarian situation? If the symbol no longer works, it seems not just pointless, but needlessly scandalous to retain it. Now, I acknowledge that because I do not understand the pastoral ministry in this sense of functioning as an intermediary, I may well be missing something important here. Still, this argument strikes me as pointless even within the circles that do see pastors in this role. And it certainly has no purchase on Protestants who do not. So you see the same shape of the argument? I don't agree with it, but even if I did, it's still bad. Okay? I've actually always wanted to be a lawyer where you could actually blow up <laughs> the other person's case five ways. Why settle with just one? But... <clears throat> So far, I have discussed the version of this argument in its explicit Roman Catholic sense. But I perceive that many Protestants who would never assert this kind of argument nonetheless do believe in a surreptitious version of it. This version presumes that since the pastor is the head of the local church, as such Christians view ecclesiology, then such a person needs to be male because only males are to lead. A feminist critique of this view of church leadership, however, would suggest that women can lead as well as men can, so there's no reason to forbid female clergy. A feminist critique, moreover, would go on to look at the structure of leadership itself and wonder, why is there this hierarchy of one big boss? Why not instead a council or college of pastors in each local church, each playing different and complementary roles. And wouldn't such a group of pastors, perhaps some of them paid full-time, some of them paid part-time, some of them maybe not paid at all, but all of them recognized as helping to shepherd the church, wouldn't such a group of pastors best include both men and women, bringing their individual gifts and whatever also inheres in their maleness or femaleness, masculinity or femininity, to the joint work of shepherding? So you see the nature of this argument? If you're only going to have one pastor, you can argue back and forth, but you shouldn't have one, just one pastor. You should have a group of shepherds, in which case, why would you exclude any important group of people whose expertise may be helpful to you? See, I put things this way because I'm appealing to the broadest possible audience, and I don't feel I have to take sides in long-standing and complicated arguments about sex versus gender, or 
male and female essence versus the social construction of masculine or female identity. If you don't know what I just said, don't worry about it, because it's only addressed to those who do know what I just said. Right? And I'm telling them I can also skate by those for the purposes I'm having tonight. These matters are important, to be sure, but I suggest that whatever one's views about them, it simply makes more biblical, theological, and pastoral sense not to put a solitary person on a pastoral pedestal. It makes sense instead to entrust pastoral leadership to a group. And unless we construe leadership in strictly masculine terms, as some, alas, still do, then no matter what we make of male, female, or masculine and feminine differences, we would want the richest possible array of relevant abilities in our pastoral team. So these are several arguments from theology. Now we'll take a look at some arguments from church history. And let's just take a moment. If, if, if some of us could move a little bit toward the middle. We've got a few latecomers who need some seats. So if we could do that, that would be obliging. We also have some seats down here in about the third or fourth row. So come on in. And uh, we'll be glad to uh, visit with you, especially since you haven't really missed much yet. There should have been a, a, a much louder response to that joke. <clears throat> I heard a couple of people saying, yeah, that's right, you know, <laughs> uh, that, and, that, and that hurts, um, uh, I, I must say, but not enough to stop me, so on I go. So let's take a look at some arguments from church history. History shows us women in leadership only in pathological situations, extreme revivalism, schismatic groups, and the rise of cults. That's this argument. We properly revere the early church fathers for bequeathing us much classic wisdom. But their general misogyny is a scandal. Most of them, so far as we know, really did see women as not only spiritually and intellectually inferior to men, but positively dangerous to men's godliness. This is one of the dirty little secrets about patristic studies. This is why, by the way, I don't believe there's a golden age of the church to which we should return. There are no golden ages. They're all pretty much tin. And some have wonderful qualities. You can build good things out of tin, but you don't call them gold. Every age is deeply marked by sin, even as it is also wonderfully marked by the Spirit of God. Such views, alas, are not confined only to late antiquity. Indeed, they remain to this day among some Christians who therefore espouse patriarchy as not only divinely ordained, but simply prudent, given women's clear inadequacies and vulnerabilities. A classic instance of this sort of argument appears in a widely used textbook among evangelicals. I'm not sure this particular textbook is used as much as it was uh, when I was a Bible school student. I will uh, read the quotation and I'll tell you where it's from. Quoting, The history of theosophy, then, is marked indelibly by the imprint of the female mind, which, ever since Eve, has apparently been vulnerable to forbidden fruit and the tantalizing tones of various varieties of serpents. It should be remembered that the Apostle Paul strictly enjoined the Christian church to forbid women the teaching ministry, especially when men were available to meet this need. It can be clearly seen from the study of non-Christian cults, ancient and modern, that the female teaching ministry has graphically fulfilled what Paul anticipated in his day by divine revelation and brought in its wake, as history tells us, confusion, division, and strife. This is true from Joanna Southcott to Mary Baker Eddy to Helena Blavatsky and the Fox sisters all of whom were living proof of our Lord's declaration that if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Wow. End quote. This is a quotation from Walter Martin, The Kingdom of the Cults, arguably the most widely used textbook among conservative evangelicals on the cults in the previous generation. The immediate response to this nonsense, of course, is simple. If it is true that a few cults have been founded by women, then we might well ask who began all the others. 
That is the vast majority of them. That's right, it was non-women. <laughs> Mercifully, few complementarians argue this way anymore. From the other side of the debate comes the recognition of women in leadership that was indeed on the margins within the Montanist movement, various women's orders in the Middle Ages, perhaps most notable the Beguines, the notorious case of Anne Hutchison in Puritan New England, female preachers in the 18th and 19th century revivals, including here in Nova Scotia, and culminating in the prominent place of women among Pentecostal and charismatic clergy in the 20th and 21st century. Now, for some traditional Christians, this checkered heritage proves that women are not to lead in mainstream churches. There is, however, a transparent catch-22 circularity to this logic. If women have not been allowed to lead within mainstream Christianity, but only in the occasional marginal movement, then female leadership necessarily will have been linked with marginal movements, thus disqualifying it from mainstream consideration. What is perhaps more positively suggestive is the presence of female leadership even within mainstream movements of various sorts. Female abbesses, mystics and teachers in the Middle Ages, such as Marjorie Kempe, Julian of Norwich, Hildegard of Bingen. Female evangelists and preachers encouraged by Charles Finney in the United States and by the Salvation Army in the UK and then worldwide. Female pastors trained by such mainstream institutions as Moody Bible Institute at the turn of the century. Even as that institution turned against the idea of women in pastoral leadership in later decades. Female missionaries and parachurch leaders from all denominations throughout the great century of Protestant missions and beyond. And women speakers today who command considerable audiences as Bible teachers and authors, even as their message is ostensibly a traditional complementarist one, such as Elizabeth Elliot and Anne Graham Lotz. All of these examples can't be dismissed as marginal. Nowadays, of course, we also can consider the experience of mainstream Protestant churches throughout the West that have employed women in pastoral and theological leadership for some decades now. Will anyone seriously gainsay the effectiveness of their labors? What indeed can complementarians make of the evident fruitfulness of their ministries among white, black, Hispanic, and other congregations in North America, the UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere? The best answer, I suppose, is to say that God still prefers only men to do it, but he will settle for the work being done by whomever will do it. But I can't say that this answer satisfies me. Instead, one might conclude that the paradigm I'm offering does a better job of explaining the phenomena. God goes along with the general social contours of patriarchal society. Even as the impress of the Holy Spirit on that society first ameliorates some of the most oppressive aspects of patriarchy and then ultimately opens it up to the full equality of women. The church, especially when it is in the white heat of revival, shows us glimpses of the order of the kingdom of God to come. But the world is not ready for it yet. So the movements subside into patriarchy, awaiting the day when such compromise is no longer strategic. That day, I have been arguing, has come in some societies. Now again, I'm not arguing that the day of the Lord has come, but rather I'm arguing on the basis of simply the obvious social reality of egalitarianism in modern societies. Therefore, the mainstreaming of women's full dignity in home and church should be a priority with all Christians in these cultures. A second argument from church history. Christian feminism is simply a capitulation to secular feminism. It is a case of sheer worldliness. 
The contention from some complementarians that Christian feminists are a pathetic group of wannabes chasing after the bandwagon of secular feminism, desperate to be au courant and politically correct, can be answered in two ways. First, the charge isn't true. Christian feminism is a hundred years older than the books of Betty Friedan and Gloria Steinem on this side of the Atlantic and of Simone de Beauvoir on the other. Christian feminism arises in the 19th century in temperance movements, suffragist movements, and in America in particular alongside abolitionist movements. So <clears throat> if the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy is here to be maintained, and that is the fallacy that after that, and therefore because of it, if that fallacy is to be maintained, we ought to be arguing, implausibly to be sure, that Ms. Friedan and so on are the ones who are trying to catch up, which no, doesn't seem likely. The second response to the charge that Christian feminism is merely a response to secular feminism is that even if it were true, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. For who cares where a good idea comes from? In the providence of God, feminist values of human dignity and human rights have come to be championed by secularists, Jews, and others who aren't Christian. Christians properly recognize and rejoice in these truths, even if we are slower than some others to grasp them. Now, in fact, however, we recognize that these values clearly have emerged out of the particular matrix of Western civilization that was shaped so deeply by biblical religion and only in that matrix in world history. So instead of resisting these values, we can be humbly grateful for this provocation from some non-Christians, as well as our fellow Christians, to recover forgotten aspects of our own tradition. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer tirelessly reminds us, Christ is the Lord of the whole world, not just of the church. And he is at work by the Spirit in the whole world, not just in the church. If someone is willing to protect the weak, feed the hungry, free the oppressed, beautify the land, or teach the truth, Christians properly give thanks to the one true God from whom all blessings flow. Thus, Christian feminists can celebrate any sort of feminism that brings more justice and human flourishing to the world, more shalom, no matter who's bringing it, since we recognize the hand of God in all that is good. And we then can contribute to feminism the distinctive insights of the gospel, and especially the model of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shows us God's will toward women and men better than does anyone else. Let's turn now to some arguments from contemporary experience and practice. First, <clears throat> The kind of argument Stackhouse has been offering can be used to support the legitimization of homosexuality. That hasn't occurred to anybody so far, right? <laughs> yeah, it has, yeah. Uh, so, so let's deal with it. It is true, in my judgment, that certain kinds of feminist arguments can be deployed in the service of defending homosexuality as a perfectly valid form of human love. I do not agree, however, that the paradigm I have offered can be used in this campaign. The cases are not, in fact, parallel. Pardon me. For one thing, the questions of the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of women have to do with social power, not sex. But to be sure, Inasmuch as homosexuals have been treated politically as subhuman, Christians must fight for their rights as hard as for anyone else's. Homosexuals are our neighbors, and we must love them as we love ourselves. Indeed, some of us are homosexual. But the, but the quest question of homosexuality in the Bible isn't ever presented as a question of a power relationship in society parallel to slaves and masters or wives and husbands. It is always described as a question of moral and spiritual health. So that's the first argument. These are not the same kinds of things in the biblical view. 
But even if one were to argue, however, that the full legitimization of homosexuality is indeed a political issue that is parallel to racism and sexism, there is still no comfort to be found in my paradigm. For I'm convinced that while there is significant tension in the Bible regarding slavery, on the one hand, slaves and masters are equal before God, on the other hand, slavery is at least temporarily condoned, and there is significant tension in the Bible regarding gender. Again, on the one hand, women and men are equal and equally gifted before God. On the other hand, patriarchy is at least temporarily condoned. There is no such tension regarding homosexuality. The Bible presents a pattern that I believe supports both the temporary, cultural, specific accommodation of slavery and patriarchy and the principles that not only support and even compel the causes of abolitionism and feminism. Right, that's what I've been arguing the last couple of days. The Bible says both things. There is no such pattern regarding homosexuality. The Bible instead is univocal from cover to cover on the matter of sexual intercourse. The only, the only, the only legitimate and healthy pattern is heterosexual, adult, and married. Not only is homosexuality ruled out, but so is every other form of sexuality that is not oriented toward and consummated within the lifelong marriage of a man and a woman. More particularly, the biblical proscription of homosexuality is not arbitrary. The Bible presents homosexuality as a psycho-spiritual pathology, and so it incurs certain restrictions appropriate to its character, such as celibacy. Contrarily, being female or being a member of a subject people is not itself bad. Indeed, the evil consists instead in the condition of subjugation by patriarchy or slavery when nothing about one's nature in fact justifies such treatment. Now, this series is not about homosexuality, so I can't and shouldn't try to develop a full discussion of it here. I simply indicate, at least briefly, why I think there is no important parallel between the cause of feminism and the cause of homosexual legitimization. Now, frankly, the two arguments that give me the most pause do not stem from biblical, theological, or historical grounds. I'm reasonably satisfied on those grounds with the model I presented as the best of those I've encountered so far. But I do want to heed warnings, first from complementarians, and then from feminists that challenge the practical implications of this model. So let's look at these. If women don't stay home, children will be neglected. As I wrote the first draft of this lecture series, the Atlantic Monthly had a cover story on how white middle-class feminists had been able to realize their dream of entering the workplace while also having children only by hiring other women to care for those children and do the housework. The supermom cannot, in fact, do it all or have it all. So in this scenario, children are not neglected, but they're being raised by caregivers who are not their parents. Further down the economic ladder, however, are many working mothers who are not realizing any dream, but working because they have to. Either they're single, as many, many mothers now are in North America, or the cost of living is such that they must join their husbands in the workforce. And their children have to be placed in one or another sort of daycare that's often of dubious quality. Now, this is a genuine challenge, and a dreadful one for many. But simply preaching a return to the traditional family is of no help. This sort of family is not found in the Bible, nor in most of the history of the church. That is, the so-called traditional family isn't found in the Bible, and it's not found in most of the history of the church. It's the family of the post-war boom, post-Second World War economic boom, in which dad could earn a household's worth of income all by himself even on an assembly line, and everyone else could stay home or in school. Such a family has now, once again, largely vanished from the economic landscape. I assume I don't have to take a lot of time talking about this in Nova Scotia. 
Many argue that these wages have disappeared, these large, relatively large living wages have disappeared because women have entered the workforce, and thus employers can lower wages in the face of a greater supply of workers. Now, I'm no economist, but obviously there are other huge factors at stake, such as increased mechanization, facilitated by computers that has replaced many industrial and clerical jobs, and factors such as globalization, facilitated by lower cost long distance transportation, changed tariffs, and improved telecommunications, resulting in many jobs being moved offshore. So wherever the blame lies, if blame is even a useful concept in matters of economic and social evolution, the traditionalist attempt to turn back the clock will not help. There's no point in calling everyone to move back to Levittown and leave it to Beaver. <laughs> Feminism can help here by reframing the challenge for each family. Instead of women's work and men's work, there's just work. And we have to get it done somehow. So what are we going to do? If it turns out that many more women than men prefer to tend the home and care for the children most of the time, whether from nature or nurture, who knows, then so be it. Those families are choosing together what to do, not automatically relegating the woman to the domestic sphere and the man to the workplace. Thus also, those unusual families in which the woman goes out to work and the man stays home, I have one set of relatives who followed this pattern at times, and our youngest son has had excellent daycare from a man who is in such a family, those kinds of unusual families are free to practice this pattern without emasculating the man or defeminizing the woman. And any intermediate arrangement, such as many families now practice, one or both spouses working less than full time and sharing in various domestic duties, also enjoy the same legitimacy. The liberty here is to do whatever makes the most of the particular gifts, desires, opportunities, and needs of the individuals that make up that family without simplistically sorting things out simply according to sex. Or does anyone still want to argue seriously that all mothers everywhere and always are much more suited to domestic duties and all men everywhere and always are much more suited to the marketplace? Again, social science demonstrates what we all now know from our experience. Such universal generalizations just aren't true of every couple. And so we need a paradigm that includes and guides everyone, not just most. A second response and argument. If this paradigm is to be believed, then the church should still not only tolerate, but even comply with patriarchy today in the many parts of the world that still practice patriarchy. And that seems repugnant. Okay, do you hear this? This is a kind of counter argument. If my logic follows, then that would mean that in many places in the world today, most places where patriarchy still dominates, then you're saying the church should still conform to that. And that seems pretty repugnant. This is an argument now from the feminist side. One critical feminist response then to this paradigm would be, would be that it is tolerant of sin in the form of the oppression of women. Indeed, this paradigm would encourage Christians to perpetuate patriarchal structures even now in those parts of the world in which society is not prepared to embrace full equality for women. Even worse, in fact, that is even worse about my paradigm, is the sin of ascribing such tolerance to the will of God, as if the Holy One can not only look upon sin, but also put up with it indefinitely and even work through it. So I think this is a pretty serious charge, which no doubt has occurred to some of you. In reply, let me say that this twofold charge is one that I do take seriously. As a feminist and egalitarian, I dislike the notion of contributing the slightest legitimacy to the perpetuation of patriarchy. As a Christian, furthermore, I hate the notion that I would ascribe to God something unworthy of him. 
As I look hard at the Bible, however, and over the 2,000 years of church history since the Bible's completion, it seems to me to be evident that God has in fact accommodated himself over and over to the weakness and even the sin of human beings. He also has called his faithful ones to a similar accommodation. The already but not yet tension is clear not only with the coming of Christ, but throughout the Old Testament story of redemption as well. God chooses a people as a vehicle for global salvation and then works with them in a convoluted trajectory of obedience and blessing, disobedience and punishment, first this way, then that way. God puts up with a compromise plan for the conquest of Canaan, blesses a monarchy he didn't want, forestalls the prophesied judgment on both northern and southern kingdoms for generations, and even then preserves a remnant and reestablishes them in Jerusalem. God works not only through Israel, but also through the empires of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Rome. God works not only through prophets and saints, but through Joseph's brothers, Balaam and his donkey, Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, Caiaphas and Pilate. Now much more needs to be said on this matter. I've said a little more in the book that Jonathan held up on the providence of God and the question of evil. I'm hoping to say more in my next book on the theology of culture. But it remains evident in scripture and history, I'm suggesting, that God does in fact draw straight with crooked lines. Because he has to draw crookedly on the tortured topography of the troubled creation he loves and is redeeming. And he calls us to do the same. Yet, this paradigm should not be construed as a call to acquiesce to patriarchy, much less is it a blessing on it. Patriarchy, I am suggesting pretty strongly, is a result of the fall. As Cornelius Plantinga suggests about sin in general, patriarchy particularly is not the way it's supposed to be. Instead, the paradigm I offer here echoes the fundamental biblical call to work for shalom, for the full flourishing of every man and every woman, every slave and every master, every child and every parent, as God gives us opportunity to do so. Where and when God doesn't give us opportunity to do so, however, we pray that he will soon. And in the meanwhile, as you notice that's a crucial phrase in this paradigm, in the meanwhile, we trust him to work his good will in and through us, whatever be the structures with which we temporarily must comply. Thus we will indeed have to comply with patriarchy, or with corrupt governments, or with exploitative businesses, or with hypocritical charities. For where are the wholly pure institutions and societies? The ones not deeply touched by evil in this world. In the meanwhile, we live as the patriarchs lived, as the prophets lived, as the apostles lived, and as saints, women, and men in every age have lived with hope in God that one day all this tension, compromise, and accommodation to our sin will be done away and with the sure sense that God is right here with us, comforting us in our oppression, forgiving us our own sins, even sins of complicity with evil, grieving with us that things have to be this way for now, and empowering us nonetheless to bring gospel light to the darkest corners of the earth. Now, I find it difficult to advance the idea that Christians, at least in some places in the world, should continue to do what I think the New Testament Christians did, which is to put up with patriarchy for a while. But I am suggesting that, in fact. And I'm sure it was much more difficult for a dedicated Christian feminist, such as Gretchen Gabeline Hull, to make exactly this same point 
almost 20 years ago, as she addresses her sisters in Christ, this following poignant plea, quoting now feminist Gretchen Gabeline Hall. Can you drink the cup of submission? Yes, I realize full well what many of you are thinking. That's all we've ever done. But I would ask of you, can you now drink the cup as Christ means you to drink it? Not because you must, but because you choose to. Would you be willing to put aside your legitimate rights if the time to exercise them is not yet right in your particular circumstances? Would you be willing to put your career on hold if that is in the best interests of your family or your cultural milieu? Will you work for change in a patient and loving manner rather than sinking into anger or bitterness? Will you commit yourself to work in a Christ-like way even if you are in unchristlike like situations?" End quote. It perhaps will clarify this point to acknowledge that the argument I am setting out in these lectures would apply to the terribly vexing problem faced by Christians today in many parts of Africa, namely polygamy. As thousands of Africans, even millions of Africans are converting to Christianity, Christian leaders properly call them to Christian morality, which includes Christian marriage of just one man and one woman. In many of the social contexts in which these converts must continue to live, however, for a man to set aside every wife but his first and all children from subsequent marriages would be to surrender them to disaster. Women have so little opportunity to make a living on their own beyond prostitution and other horrific occupations that Christian leaders feel caught in a clash of Christian values. Applying my paradigm to this situation would involve recognizing polygamy as it appears in the Old Testament, just as it appears today in Africa, polygamy as an accommodation to deep social problems and as itself a social problem, not as God's ideal. One struggles in vain to find in the Old Testament a happy polygamous home. Thus it seems to me that Christian leaders can condone polygamy immediately where it seems the most helpful way for women and children the little ones and the oppressed in these social structures. And as they do so, Christians simultaneously ought to teach the better way of Christian monogamy and ought to work for the transformation of society such that polygamy can be done away as soon as possible. Now a couple of concluding comments and perhaps we'll finally say something provocative. could happen. Such conclusions cannot sit easily with any feminist, and I doubt that they satisfy any complementarian. But may I say again that the theological challenge is not to solve every difficulty perfectly, nor is it to convince everyone else. The theological challenge for me and for you and for all of us in our churches is to select the best option among those available. It has seemed to me for some time then that this paradigm, or something like it, takes seriously the concerns, arguments, and strengths of both sides, and also compensates for at least some of the weaknesses of both sides. I think it squares best with the eschatological tension in which we really live, already but not yet. I think it matches up best with the pattern of God's actual activity in the Bible, as well as with particular teachings about gender and I think it's been borne out in the history of the church. I do not pretend, however, to have solved every exegetical, theological, historical, or practical problem, even to my own satisfaction, much less anyone else's. And I recall Paul's good advice. Quote, Each of us will be accountable to God. Let us, therefore, no longer pass judgment on each other, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. End of quote, Romans 14. So I ask then that you will forgive me if this series has been a stumbling block or a hindrance to you in any of its particulars or in its substance. Set it aside if it has. There's been too much antagonism, even violence in this debate. 
My prayer instead has been to follow the scriptural injunction. One of my favorite verses, Hebrews 10, 24. Let's consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. So if you've been provoked, I pray God that he will channel that provocation into spiritual fruit from which many women and men will benefit to the glory of his name. And so a final provocation, and then we'll have some comments and questions from you. Let's be clear with ourselves and with each other that no one makes up his or her mind about such a set of crucial issues simply on the basis of theological argument. We dare not flatter ourselves that we sit on some intellectual height, calmly weighing each item in the balance of our finely calibrated intellects and entirely sanctified souls. We are all helplessly and thoroughly invested in a particular set of assumptions about gender, whatever that set may be. We are all enmeshed in social structures that reward or punish us because of our sex and because of our views of gender. We simply cannot be disinterested as we decide about this huge and hugely important set of issues. So let's own up to that fact. And let us ask ourselves these questions. What do I really want to believe about gender? Why do I want to believe that? In particular, what do I think I have to gain or lose by coming to this or that conclusion? And what are the voices in my head telling me to decide on one or another alternative? And how do I feel about each of those voices? And having asked those questions, then we can ask this question in response. How can I compensate for my own predispositions, limitations, and desires in order to hear the voice of God as clearly and searchingly and transformingly as possible? We will make no progress on this question if we do not open our hearts as well as our minds to the Spirit of God. In the good company of fellow Christians, with the attitude of submission to whatever God will say to us, the cross stands over us here as it does everywhere. And so let us say, as God's people ought always to say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Thank you.